It's on a kind of crisp autumn day, not too unlike today. Um, I was on my college campus, and um, I was um, walking through our courtyard at the campus, and I saw uh, a young woman, uh, one of our fellow college students, who was in the grass, and um, she had drawn something on the ground and had some objects laying on the ground, and it looked like she was praying. It looked like she was worshiping. It looked like she was busy uh, attending to something uh, very important. And there came two uh, young men of the college campus who walked by, and um, as they stumbled upon this uh, young college woman as well, um, they went up and started talking with her. And I was at some distance, so I didn't see um, what was transpiring. But it appeared to me that the conversation wasn't going very well. And uh, partway through the conversation, um, one of them picked up some debris on the ground and kind of threw it at the girl, almost in her face. And they laughed. And they told her to go away. And they walked off. So I went up to this young woman, and I, uh, kind of shocked uh, about what I had just seen, asked her what had happened. And uh, she said that she was um, a pagan and was practicing a, a ritual here on the, on the grounds of the campus. And uh, she said that the two had taunted her and said that, um, that she was Satan and that she was going to hell and that she needed to repent and um, cease what she was doing and follow Jesus Christ. My heart broke when I heard what these two young men had said to this young woman. And something stirred within me that said that I can never allow something like that to happen again, not in a place that I love and I call home. I can never allow Christians who profess faith in a loving God to behave and act in such a way towards someone who is not of their same faith or tradition. And so I began the work of gathering people uh, at the uh, college and creating what I called um, the Spirituality Association of Ripon College. Uh, in a way, I had begun some work of reformation. I would started off with our college campus um, Christian fellowship and um, wanted to talk about the ways in which we as Christians on campus could be more loving and caring for each other, and maybe do works of service um, rather than just worship services. And uh, I was somewhat met with a cold shoulder and told that we would talk about it. Um, but I could tell that their intention was uh, to, first of all, save souls and uh, go about that work. So it got me thinking, and as I said, I developed this uh, new uh, organization at the college campus called the Spirituality Association of Berkeley College. And it began bringing in ministers from the outside community, the Catholic priest in town, uh, the Presbyterian minister, even our own college president uh, of the college, who was a Presbyterian minister himself. And uh, we engaged in not only ecumenical dialogue, but interfaith dialogue, and we talked about what makes us different and unique, and what makes our individual strengths strong. And what became very apparent throughout these conversations was that there was a need on the college campus for these conversations. People wanted to talk about something bigger than uh, just repentance and getting saved. There was a need there to address some of the social injustices which God calls us to do. I discovered in the midst of many conversations that people loved God with their whole heart, soul, mind, and body, and they wanted to love their neighbor as themselves. I think sometimes the church can get a little off track. I think we can add a lot of things to what it means to be Christian. And what if one of 
of the most powerful things about the Protestant Reformation is that it calls us to repentance. It calls us to remember that Jesus, who walked this earth, who professed such extravagant faith in God, and who shared with us the Holy Spirit that changed our hearts, that sent us back out into the world to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, to follow the greatest commandment, as Jesus calls it, the Shema, to, to love the Lord our God with all our very being. The experience of watching um, another student on campus um, get hurt in the way that she did uh, reminded me that in our world we see injustices, and we are called as people of faith to go out and, and do justice and seek for there to be better ways of being in Christian community and dialogue and conversation. Pardon me, I have a note here that I'm just going to share, but I'm not sure where it went. Aha! <laughs> 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 Martin Luther, when he uh, took the courage to share his, his 95 Theses, now the story that he nailed the 95 Theses onto the door of Wittenberg uh, Cathedral may be more myth than reality, but still his ideas spread like fire within the communities. Those Christians knew that there needed to be better conversations about not just repenting, and the main topic of that era was the, to do with penance, paying the Catholic Church so that you could be saved from going to hell. You could pay your way out of purgatory. And Martin Luther thought that that was an absurd idea because God's grace is freely given. And there's no amount of money or penance that we could ever pay that God would bestow that upon us. For it is already ours. All we need to do is acknowledge and see that Jesus, the Christ, is the one who is leading us toward God, who is the one who redeems us and reforms us. In the book of Jeremiah, we hear how Jeremiah says that, that the Lord will make a new covenant with us and restore us to our faith. And that will not be like the covenant that God made with our ancestors, but will be a new kind. And so for us, I think it's important to think about the ways in which we are creating new covenants here and now. Our pilgrim ancestors created the Mayflower Compact, a new idea, just like the 95 Theses, that would set us in better Christian community. And the Mayflower Compact led the pilgrims across the Atlantic Ocean, and to settle here into the Americas, and to spread their ideas of a free church, one based on individual ideas, the ability to read the Bible on your own, and with God's uh, assistance, interpret the scriptures, and discover meaning in our own lives. In the early 1960s, in 1968, the media coverage of the aftermath of the Vietnam War, specifically the Tet Offensive, increased protests and opposition to that very war, especially among young university students who saw something that was not Christian happening in the world. War and violence finally turned students into uh, a, a threshold group who said that there is a moment of transformation happening before us, and we must do something. And so demonstrations and protests followed over the years. Well, in March 1968, uh, a famous person by the name of John Lennon was in India, reflecting on the new music that he would be writing and singing with his band, The Beatles. And when The Beatles gathered, to go about creating their new album, which would become known as the White Album, John Lennon shared a song that he had written 
called Revolution. He wrote, you say you want a revolution. Well, you know, all, we all want to change the world. You tell me that it's evolution. Well, you know, we all want to change the world. But when you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? Don't you know that it's going to be all right? John Lennon's words were to say that we do want fervently to change and reform this world and make it a better place to live and be. And we can do that through peace and justice, through nonviolence, just as Christ did. And when you want to talk about destruction and violence, when you want to talk about throwing sticks and stones at people who are not like you because you want them to change, when you want to talk about that, well, you can count me out. John Lennon believed in a different way. He believed in a third way, a Jesus way, in which the real solution doesn't do with breaking down people, but building people up. You say you've got a real solution. Well, you know, we'd love to see the plan. You ask me for a contribution, well, you know, we're doing what we can. But when you want money for people with minds that hate, all I can tell you, brother, is you have to win. Don't you know, it's going to be all right. Well, say you want to change the Constitution. Well, you know, we all want to change your head. You tell me it's the institution. Well, you know, you better free your mind instead. But if you go carrying pictures of Chairman Mao, you ain't going to make it with anyone, anyhow. Don't you know it's going to be all right? John Lennon says that if we want to change the institution, it's got to start with our heads. We've got to start with our minds, bodies, souls, and spirits. Indeed, isn't that where Jesus says that we need to start? with our own understanding of what it means to be a Christian. If we begin with love of self, if we begin with love of God, if we begin with love of neighbor, for indeed all the other commandments are built upon that greatest commandment, then you know what? Everything's going to be all right. You say you want a revolution, you say we want a reformation. Well, you know, we all want to change the world. And the good news is that today's church looks very different from Martin Luther's church of 500 years ago. And the scary, perhaps wondrous thing is that this church will, in the future, look nothing like it does today. Here's the most important thing that you will hear today. God is not yet done reforming. God is not yet done reforming you. God is not done with you yet. And God is not done with all of us. And so the question we might ask is, what are we being reformed to do? What are we reforming toward? Are we just reforming for the sake of reformation? What is this purpose? I believe our UCC uh, fellow minister, Yvette Flunder, says it best. She says, I need the reformation so that I can undress Jesus from all the things that we have layered upon him. See, we have layered so much upon Jesus. We have added to his sayings, his actions, his thoughts and feelings. We have projected onto him our own hopes and desires. He has become not just Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus the Christ, but he has become our friend and personal savior and even political justification. So much so that he has entered into our own daily lives. Indeed, we even ask what would Jesus do, projecting onto him the questions that we carry for our own lives. WWJD. Or as one youth at La Foray uh, during a retreat once reflected, what would Jesus wear? 
red or pink nail nail polish. Well, we need a reformation so that we can strip all that off of the Jesus that our churches project out into the world and return back to the Bible. As Martin Luther would say, sola scriptura, only scripture guides us. When we return to the, the gospel lessons and read about a Christ who is so extravagant with his love and grace, when he challenges the authorities and admits, when he set about reforming the church in his day and age, we discover a model reformer for ourselves. Indeed, Jesus calls each and every single one of us to reformation here and now. You say you want a reformation. Well, you know, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and if you love yourself the same, and if you love your neighbor as yourself, well, you know, we're going to have a reformation. We're going to have a revolution. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to sing.